Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to our Mayor Capital Annual Meeting 2021. We're so happy to see so many of you from across the globe. Um, I'm pleased to say that the Mayor team are actually here today in our London office, social distancing of course, and we look forward to collaborating and providing you with an enjoyable experience. I'd like to start by thanking each and every one of you for your continued support and trust throughout the year. We do appreciate that this has been an exceptionally challenging year for so many, uh, and we do appreciate your ongoing support and trust. We were delighted to recently celebrate the fund's 10 year anniversary, and we'll soon be sending a gift to mark this occasion to all our investors. We're going to commence shortly by hearing from the team, and we will then move on to a, a Q&A session where we look forward to answering all your questions. Many thanks to those of you who have already submitted your questions. And if you would like to submit a question during today's session, please do so by typing it into the Q&A box. We will, of course, do our utmost to answer all questions. However, if we do run out of time, you can also email any questions across to info at mayarcapital.com and we will ensure that every question receives a response. Just to clarify, you will not be seen or heard at all during the session today. And also just to inform you that today's meeting will be recorded and the recording will be sent to all attendees afterwards. In a moment, I will be providing a very brief HR update. I will then hand over to our COO, Stefan Davidovsky, who will provide an update on operations. Mark will then provide an update on the launch of our new USITS fund, addressing some fre frequently asked questions. Mark will then outline any change in AUM throughout the year. Mark will then hand over to Aziz, who will discuss performance positioning and value investing. Aubrey will then discuss some of our holdings in greater detail. After Aubrey has spoken, we'll move into the Q&A session, where we look forward to answering your questions. So uh, just to begin with an HR update, uh, when we last spoke, we had just hired Stefan Davidovsky, our COO, who I'm pleased to report is here today and will be speaking to you shortly. There have been two additions to the team since then. Uh, we very recently hired a new analyst, Jack Winchester, who is now working alongside Aubrey in our expanded research team. We received an unprecedented response for this position, hundreds of applicants in fact, which forced us to rethink our hiring process. As a result, we expanded on our previous efforts to improve our hiring process and minimise bias by introducing a series of online assessment tests to help us rank and select candidates that apply to an open position. While this is not a fully blind process, we believe that by using more objective measures in the early stages of the hiring process and using automation tools, we can expand the talent pool we can select from, while also reducing bias compared to a more traditional process that re uh, relies solely on interviews. Uh, we've also just hired a new PA to Aziz, Hannah Matawa, who is also here with us today. Hannah will commence her role next week, while my role will evolve more uh, to more of a focus on HR and business services. That's all from me for the moment. Uh, I hope you enjoy the meeting and I'm now going to hand over to our COO, Stefan Davidovsky. Hi, I'm Fawaz Alamalki at Venture One Legal. It was a pleasure setting up Mayor Fund and working with Aziz 10 years ago. And it's an honor to still be with them on this journey. I wish Aziz and his amazing team another 10 years of continued growth and success. All the best. Happy 10th anniversary. Good afternoon. It's good to be speaking to you all again. Um, when thinking about what I wanted to say to you, I felt it was important to highlight what the past year has meant for Mayor Capital from an operational standpoint. Um, last year's meeting focused really on five points uh, for on operation wise. Um, a full review of the incumbent operational process, implementation and integration of HedgeGuard and order management and uh, portfolio management system, um, the FCA authorization, my appointment as compliance officer, and operational best practice. Of these five points, most have been fully achieved and all to some degree. Um, the operational process from order generation all the way through to net asset value monthly review are now in a more robust state. As you know, FCA authorization 
um, of a MIFID license was granted in February 2021. Operational best practice is much closer to being realised, though, of course, there's always work to do. Um, and I will be assuming the compliance officer role in the near future. Um, and earlier this year, we engaged Thistle as our compliance consultants full time. This year, we'll see the following changes to, to the lay to the lay to lay the operational groundwork for the redomiciliation of the Mayor Fund from a Cayman entity to an Irish Usage Fund. Mark will be covering this transition later in the presentation in more detail. And you would have seen last week's investor notice about this transition. The operational changes are swapping out the portfolio and order management platform from HedgeGuard to the SSNC um, ES Eclipse platform. We've also moved the administration location from Apex Bahrain to Apex Ireland, moving middle office services to in-house, um, having these, these having been outsourced for, for quite some time. With these developments, we will have a platform that will be able to systematically apply and monitor various compliance restrictions or the various compliance restrictions that UCITS funds fall under. The combination of an administrator that deals with UCITS funds, a system that provides greater reporting flexibility and compliance monitoring, and in-house operations that have clearer oversight of the books and records of the PMS system, will give Mayer a flexible platform from which we can grow at a sustained and controlled rate. As ever, the operational group's aim is to ensure your assets are invested in a controlled, safeguarded and compliant environment. Last year, we took steps and made improvements to achieve this and 2021 will see further work to ensure this primary operational aim continues. Good to speak to you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Talal Azam. I would like to take the opportunity to congratulate Abdul Aziz and his team for the remarkable achievements they have accomplished over the past decade. I believe they have performed major global indices. I wish them continued growth and success, inshallah, in the future. Well, thank you to Stefan and thank you to everyone joining us on the call today. Uh, I want to reiterate the gratitude and honour that we feel for you choosing Mayer as uh, custodians of your capital. It's, uh, it's an honour we feel very personally uh, and it's, it's a great honour for me and the rest of the team. One of the obligations of that honour, of course, is to communicate with you uh, openly and transparently. One of the things you would have heard Stefan talk about in his uh, piece just a second ago is the move from the, of the fund from the Cayman Islands to Ireland. And I wanted to go through a few of the frequently asked questions to address those concerns uh, that any of you may have about what it means for you, your investment and the mayor approach. So the first of these questions, of course, is why is it moving from Cayman Islands to Ireland in the first place? Well, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with Cayman Islands as a fund domicile. In fact, it can be a sensible decision for small or establishing managers to launch in the Cayman funds because the regulatory burden and the operational costs are much lower for funds starting out. At some point, though, there is a tipping point where the advantages of the lower regulations and the lower operating costs start to become outweighed by the difficulties in raising capital in broader markets. And that's pretty much where we find ourselves uh, today. So we've taken the decision to move the fund from Cayman Islands to Ireland and uh, incorporate it into the European Union's UCITS regulatory framework, which is a global gold standard. Uh, the decision to move to Ireland was really between Ireland and Luxembourg. service providers and we could switch the fund with as little disruption to you the existing investors as possible 
And that drove a lot of the decision making throughout this entire project. It was important to us that our existing investors that have always supported us should be as uh, uh, should see the process as smooth as possible. And we we hope that uh, will be the the case. Are there any benefits from you as investors from this change? Well, I'm happy to report that the answer is yes. So funds domiciled in Ireland benefit from numerous tax treaties, which means that withholding tax on dividends is a lot lower for Irish domiciled investment funds when compared with the Cayman Islands. We've uh, done, run some analysis on our portfolio and we anticipate that all things being equal, that the benefit in terms of, uh, of tax reduction will be about 0.15%, which will find its way through to your investment um, investment returns. Irish investment funds as well do not um, uh, are not subject to tax, uh, regardless of where the in Ireland that this is, regardless of where the investor is resident. So if you don't pay any tax on your investment now, you won't in the future either under the current uh, legal framework. Will investors have to pay more for the fund? No. Uh, as mentioned earlier, there is a tipping point where the AUM becomes feasible to launch a USITS fund. That's around $50 million. The fund has uh, just gone over the $100 million mark. Again, thank you for your support uh, with that. But that means that we're well on our way to delivering economies of scale in terms of operating costs that we can pass through to your ultimate return. We anticipate the fund size to be in excess of $150 million. So that gives us a good margin of safety when it comes to lowering operating costs as a proportion of the assets under management. Now, you will have heard that the uh, USITS regulatory environment is, uh, is stricter than the Cayman uh, environment. Does that mean that the strategy will have to change? No, it doesn't. Again, one of the things that we did at the beginning of this project was analyze analyze the mayor portfolio within the context of the usage regulations to see whether over the 10 years now that we've been running, whether the fund breached it, whether some of the performance that you've enjoyed over the past 10 years has been created by a portfolio that ultimately would be outside those regulations. I'm happy to report that the answer was that the, the fund has operated very comfortably within those uh, parameters for the vast majority of, it, of its track record. And so that will mean that the, uh, the, the there's no requirement to change the philosophy, the process, the objective or anything that, uh, that we've been doing over the, the last 10 years. The investment team uh, for the past two years have been monitoring these um, monitoring these regulations on a daily basis to ensure that we're com compliant and also ensure, again, a seamless transition from the Cayman uh, domiciled entity to the Irish entity. And so I guess why now? Again, we think about the scale. The $50 million was uh, fund size, was the tipping point. Um, and at that point, expected AUM operating costs were roughly equal between Ireland and the Cayman Islands. We've gone way beyond that now. So again, as I say before, uh, not only will the fees at headline level remain the same, the operating costs of the fund will be much lower as well, which will ultimately benefit everybody. Uh, part of the uh, reason is now that uh, Mayor AUM is around $250 million. That brings us into the, uh, the scope and uh, the, the site of big, larger, more institutional investors in, uh, in Europe, uh, the UK and, uh, and beyond. And we believe that this change is necessary to allow the Mayor Fund to grow and fulfil its potential and with that widen the potential investor uh, investor pool. And that's how the usage structure will be fundamentally different to, for the ability for Mayor to raise assets in the, in the future. Uh, we'll all benefit from those uh, economies of scale and um, we'll also hope to build on the momentum of the uh, AUM that you can see has, uh, has risen with your support over the last few years. At the end of April, we were uh, around $236 million. We've welcomed some new investors uh, during the course of May. We've got a strong pipeline for June 
and beyond as well. So we're roughly around the $250 million mark for, uh, uh, we, we should be breaching that uh, milestone in the coming weeks and months. So we thank you once again for, uh, for your help there. Uh, so hopefully that gives you some comfort with the, um, uh, with the rationale for, that, for the move. Uh, I'll be back at this podium uh, later on in the presentation for the Q&A session. So if you could uh, continue to post your questions in the, in the Q&A box, I'd be uh, most grateful. But for now, I am going to hand over to the very capable hands of Aziz, who will take you through performance, positioning and future outlook uh, for the Mayor Fund. So uh, I will see you for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Dear Aziz, dear Mayor team, congratulations on your 10th anniversary. Over the last 10 years, you've seen a lot. You've done a lot. You've achieved a lot. And we at Privium are pleased that we could contribute to your success. But according to these guys, 10 years is just the beginning. So we wish you a nice future with health and successes, both for your investors as well as for the entire team. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to the annual meeting. Ten years. Wow. I, I don't know. I don't know if I could have imagined how quickly it's it's gone and how well it's gone. Uh, we uh, recently celebrated the launch of the Mayor Fund. Uh, Ten years since the launch of the Mayor Fund uh, last month, and I'm very excited to announce that the fund is now rated five stars by Morningstar for three, five, and ten-year performance. An exceptional achievement that the team at Mayor has been able uh, to do. I'm so proud to have a wonderful, amazing team that uh, we've built uh, this together over the past few years. In addition to uh, the five star rating, we also now have a five globes rating for sustainability by Morningstar, and we continue to have a five out of five rating by Lipper for total return, consistent return, and preservation of capital. A uh, quick update on the performance since inception. So you can see that a fund is up if you invested $100,000 at inception in class A, the net of expenses and fees, you'd have $320,000 today compared to $255,000 if you had invested in the MSCI world. That is an annualized rate of performance of 12.8% compared to 10.3% uh, for the MSCI world. The part that I always like to highlight is the part that you see in the bottom left in the red box, which is the capture ratio. Uh, I think this is one of the most important ratios for any investors to look at when looking at any investment. And the key here that I want to show is that you want the upside capture to be higher than the downside capture. What that means is that when the market goes up, you go up with the market or close to what the market has done, which is what we've done. But then when the market goes down, you preserve capital. That allows you to start from a higher base when markets recover over time that accumulates into a massive advantage uh, for your long term returns. And in a way, I think I've described it in the past as by winning by not losing. And I think this is key to a long term success. So let's just take a very quick uh, look at the performance contribution over the past 12 months. The biggest contributor to a return, the biggest two more or less, have been UPS and Vestas, and not surprisingly for the bulk of that time, they were our two biggest uh, investments. But then you see going down that list, a fairly wide range of contributor to our uh, performance. Uh, over the same period, there have been underperformers, which you could see at the bottom part of the slide. But given, again, artificially where we're measuring it up from right after the beginning, of the pandemic, it's not surprising that we haven't had any investment that actually lost money for us in that period. Not to say that it doesn't happen normally in any period of time. So just 
want to highlight that so we know what you're looking at. And then I want to switch over and talk a little bit about portfolio positioning, which we've talked about uh, in previous meetings. Uh, but the biggest shift, I think, more than any other year, 2020, because of the volatility that we've seen caused by the uh, COVID pandemic, the changes in both industry weights and geographic weights have been relatively big. In fact, our portfolio turnover was exceptionally high during 2020. That is not normally what we, our portfolio looks like or our behavior is. However, it's also, it also wasn't a normal year, A, and B, the pace of that recovery from that uh, uh, decline that happened in, in March was also excep exceptionally fast. So you see when you go back and compare kind of our exposure to North America, which has been drifting down over the years, you do see it continue. There's a little bit of an uptick because we did buy a little bit more U.S. stocks and and US market has done so well since then, but you do see a continued of that trend. But again, the thing to focus on, I think, is the second bit of geographic exposure, which is Europe. It's something that we've been talking about for a few years. We still think that long term Europe has is, continues to present us with much better hunting ground uh, than the US market because of valuation. Uh, that being said, there are exceptions from time to time, and you will see that we've bought some US stocks including at, whether adding to existing names or new ones throughout that period. Uh, but valuation is always going to be guiding us uh, to where we go. We're not sitting around and I'm not trying to decide, oh, we want exposure to this or that. It's the same thing uh, with how we decide in our cash. It's the residual. We go where the opportunities go, where our uh, process leads us uh, to go. And if we look at industry exposure, again, as always, very broad exposure to multiple industries. You'll see some, again, big moves. If you look at the second grouping, which is the capital goods, you'll see a big increase in 2020 as we invested more in industrials, uh, uh, especially uh, at, the, at the bottom of the market. But then you see us cutting down on them as the economy recovered and you see us uh, building that home builders uh, a basket of, of stocks that we've talked about in the past uh, that we still actually think is, is, is very good exposure. And the rest is kind of again just uh, moving a little bit here and there. Let us look at our 10 uh, biggest stocks. Uh, biggest is now UPS, uh, Unilever, SAP, J&J, LabCorp, Electronic Arts, I think we've mentioned before that we've added to electronic arts more recently. And then I'll talk a little bit later uh, about the uh, uh, Danone, which is our biggest ad over the past year. It's a new position that we initiated earlier in this year. There's going to be another one that we also initiated recently that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, uh, Discovery and Nordstrom. Now, a look at the trading activity over the period. Uh, we mentioned the, the UK builders, which we've added to later in the year. And again, uh, it's especially the second half of the year. It's been uh, the biggest uh, source of uh, new positions. I mentioned Danone, which I talked about in my first query letter. And then the last new position here is a US company called Von Tier. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about this in more detail in, in, in the upcoming letter. Uh, but also we've exited some long uh, held positions and some things that we've bought more recently during the past 12 months. Most notably, we've exited uh, Microsoft probably a bit too early, but like I said in the past, you're always going to be valuation conscious. Uh, and a booking is something that we bought at the at the like the depth of the pandemic, and it recovered very quickly, much much more quickly than we expected. But also reached a valuation that we believe incorporated a much faster recovery than we did. This is again, we sold it before even vaccines were out there just because we thought that the stock has incorporated too much uh, positive news. And then we've done a little bit of adding and reducing around some of the existing holdings. As you see, I won't go through all of them, but again, all of the additions and reductions are always driven purely by valuation. The sales and buys are often more fundamental, though occasionally, as is the case with Booking and Microsoft and Denon, it was purely driven uh, by valuation. Something also to note here is uh, voting. Uh, this is a question that's come up in the past, and we I thought it'd be a good opportunity to highlight it. Uh, 
this time. We are not in the business of trying to second guess every managerial decision. Uh, so we've always, I mean, A, we're not activist investors in principle, uh, but we also believe that when you invest with good management teams, you should trust them most of the time. So you'll see that a lot of the time we do vote with the management. However, every now and then, as you'll see here, when we do find something that we fundamentally object to, we will exercise our duty, our fiduciary duty, to, to vote uh, against uh, management or with, with whichever way we think is in the best interest of shareholders, including us and you, uh, for the benefit of the company. So you'll see that we voted against most of the things that we voted against have to do with executive compensation, specifically around how compensation was designed. Now I want to go into another topic uh, and dive a little bit uh, deeper into it, which is the whole discussion of whether value investing is dead or that it no longer works. Now this these are wise words from that Bob Dylan and I have written. Uh, so now you don't talk so loud. Now you don't seem so proud about having to be scrounging your next deal. How does it feel? How does it feel? It's been a tough few years. Every value investor agrees. And I think you will also agree that a career in songwriting is probably not a good idea for me. But I, what I wanted to get into here is this idea that is actually backed by evidence that it's been really tough to be a value investor the past decade. And if you look at this chart, which we got from a paper by Research Affiliate, and I've highlighted in yellow two things that are exceptional. The first one is the degree of the drawdown in the performance of value against growth. Now, there have been uh, drawdowns that are pretty bad, and you can see the tech bubble one was pretty bad. Not as bad as this one, but pretty bad. But in the past, they've been relatively short. So two years, three years, there have been a bunch of shorter ones, but 13 years and six months is way too long for anyone's career to survive, which is why this has been an issue for a lot of value investors and a lot of investors and allocators who do invest with value managers. It's been long, it's been painful, and it's been huge. And the question is, what's changed? Is it different this time? So, three main arguments have been made around why value investing has underperformed the past 13 years. The first one is that, listen, it was all illusion, it was data mining, value investing as a strategy never actually outperformed. Now there's a lot of very strong and well done studies that show empirically that it does or has outperformed in the past, no matter how you measure it across countries, across so it's, the empirical evidence is too overwhelming. And I think it's very easy to dismiss this first one. The second argument is that, listen, it used to work when Ben Graham or was doing it and when Buffett was sitting around looking, sifting through the Moody's manual by himself. But now everyone basically knows that value investing works. And so it's become a crowded trade. In a sense, value as a strategy has become a victim of its own success. Well, that makes a lot of sense until you look at the evidence. If you look over the past 13 years, if this was a crowded trade, value should become more popular. But in fact, if you look at the relative valuation of value stocks relative to growth stocks, it actually went the other way around. In fact, that degree of dispersion is in, in performance is more than explained by, and I'll get into the details a little bit, but more than explained by value becoming less popular than growth over that period. So in fact, fewer people buying value, value is getting cheaper relative to itself historically and relative to growth. So it's the, the evidence is inconsistent with this becoming a crowded trade. The third argument, which I think is the most 
interesting one, and the most the one most likely to be true, is the idea that listen, the economy has changed, the world has changed, maybe value doesn't work because of that. And I think that's an argument worth digging deeper into and actually exploring in some depth. So let's do that. I want to first start. I took this uh, graphic from a paper uh, a few months ago by research affiliate affiliates, and it looks at what I like about it. It tries to explain the sources of the value versus growth outperformance, or we don't even have to use the word outperformance. The differential in performance between the two strategies, and the HML is basically the high to low. Uh, a book value, which is basically value versus growth uh, performance. Now, they split it into three sources. The first one is something that they call the revaluation effect. The second one is what they call the income yield. And the third one is called the migration uh, component. And allow me, please, I don't want to spend a, a lot of time on this paper. It's up there for you to read, and I highly recommend that you do. But allow me to dig a little bit deeper into it. Now, I want to talk about the second two factors here, which together research affiliate have coined the term the structural component of our performance. So the two there, the income yield and migration, are what they think are structural differences between the two. So let me explain what each one is. So the income yield factor is growth companies typically grow faster than value companies and they are more profitable. So as a result, over long periods of time, their profitability within the index, the earnings embedded in a basket of these names will grow higher and faster over time. This factor definitely hel helps the growth strategy because it drives a lot of performance, positive performance for growth versus value uh, companies which grow slower and are typically less profitable. So that goes in the, uh, the bucket of, of helping the growth strategy. The migration effect on the other hand is every time a stock does very well, i.e. becomes more expensive, it will leave the, the value bucket and enter the growth bucket. And every time a stock does worse, i.e. becomes cheaper, leaves the growth bucket and enters the value bucket. It can be in neutral, but I'm, I'm generalizing here. This factor actually helps the value strategy or the value bucket because you're buying cheaper things all the time and selling things as they become more expensive. So this rebalancing between cheap and expensive historically helps value stocks and continues to. Now, those two factors tend to offset each other then. And if you look at them over long periods of time, the migration effect has been bigger than the income yield effect. And that means that the combined structural component has given a positive edge to value versus growth. And that is the source of values outperformance over decades uh, and, and, and in multiple geographies and, and time. Now let's go back to the revaluation part. So the revaluation part is something that I mentioned earlier, which is the relative value of the growth bucket compared to the value bucket. Now, if you observe this over long periods of time, this has actually been a tiny effect in its contribution to the total performance of the value versus growth performance differential. So basically, sometimes this is positive, sometimes it's negative. Over time, it's more or less a wash. We'll come back to this point, so please uh, remember that. Now let us jump into that question about whether the economy has changed, the world has changed, and, and see if that's true. So the most obvious thing, of course, that we can all agree on, I think it's no secret, that the world has changed. The world always changes, but there seems to be an acceleration of change, at least in some industries. And those industries do seem to be becoming or taking a bigger and bigger share of the economy. And I think this is key. 
So people sometimes talk about tech, but actually it's not only tech. What's, what's growing in importance in the economy over the previous several decades, this is not a new thing, is the growing importance of intangibles in the economy. There are more and more intangibles and less and less hard assets that are required to generate profits uh, by corporations. Now, what does this mean? It means that two things. One, when companies invest in, say, research and development, and they may end up with a patent, all of the money that gets spent in developing that, all of the development dollars go and run through the profit and loss statement. So they get expensed, giving this company lower earnings than otherwise during this period. Also, at the same time, all of that amount of money does not get capitalized on the balance sheet, unlike a factory, say, which gives this company a lower book value than otherwise. So the example that Research Affiliates mentions in the paper is when a company takes a billion dollars out of its bank account and builds a factory tomorrow for a billion dollars, the balance sheet does not change. It moves from one asset to another. But when a company takes a billion dollars and spends it on R&D, that's immediately expensed. It hurts the balance sheet and it hurts the profit and loss statement or income statement. What this means is that when we use measures such as price to book or even price to earnings to decide whether a company is cheap or not, whether it's a growth stock or a value stock, we're actually measuring things incorrectly. We're not comparing apples to apples. Now, this is what, what we think is driving a big part of, of this growth value disconnect. And actually, this is why I encourage you to read this paper. I'm using a lot of material out of it because it's really, really well done. So the first chart on your left shows that increase in the importance of intangibles. No secret. You see it's been happening for a very long time, but it seems to be not only accelerating in terms of within each company, but also those types of companies are becoming a bigger part of the economy and the market. So what research affiliates did is they took those expensed R&D dollars, which are assets. I mean, I mean, you don't invest in R&D expecting to lose money the same way you don't build a factory expecting to lose money. Sure, sometimes it doesn't work out, but sometimes you build a factory and it doesn't work out. So what they did is they took this, these intangible investments and they capitalized them. They treated them the same way you would treat physical plant and equipment and then rerun those growth and value uh, uh, measures or, or buckets, you want to call them, over time to see what happens when you compare book, sorry, book value high to low with this new measure, which they called IHL, IHML. Two things emerge. The first thing that emerges is over long periods of time, the value factor continues to actually outperform. Great news. Now, the surprising thing actually is many companies that were previously, sorry, and as you expect, many companies that were in the growth bucket now that they have a much bigger uh, balance sheet because we've capitalized all these expenses, turn out to be trading at a much lower multiple than we thought. They're much cheaper than what you thought, and they end up being in the value bucket. So that helps the performance of value. But actually, the other thing that's surprising that happened is a lot of companies that were previously in the value bucket turn out to be more expensive once, in a relative sense once you do that, and they move into that growth bucket. And the net effect is value does even better over time than previously thought. A and B, the other thing is the period of underperformance is not 13 and a half years under this measure, but it's about three and a half years. So yes, the, and the drawdown is smaller. Now the drawdown is still big, 
but actually very similar to the tech bubble drawdown. It's longer, it's three and a half years so far. I think there's evidence that it's already done, but we'll see. Uh, but it's not 13 and a half years, which is key because you should expect these factors to underperform from time to time for two or three years. That's normal, always has. And so when you adjust and actually compare things kind of apples to apples, it seems that value is doing just fine. Now, the other thing that they point out, which I think is also very interesting, is this idea of the structural premium that we talked about, the migration versus the income yield. And that seems to be intact as well. So they talk about it here. They say the structure return is distinctly smaller, but it remains positive and economically meaningful. The value effect to be, appears to be alive and well, albeit weaker than in the past. Now, I want to show you one more thing, which is we, the last thing I want to leave you with. I talked earlier about that revaluation factor being a small component and mostly neutral to the debate over long periods of time and how that's driven more than 100% of that outperformance. So all of the underperformance of value over the past 13 years, and then some, has come from that revaluation effect. Just how unlikely, how, how big is, is, is this? How unlikely for it to be both in magnitude and time this big? I mean, look at this histogram of, of, of drop. Look, we are already way left all the way in left on, on, on that chart in terms of how, in terms of the distribution, how unlikely this is uh, to happen. But more importantly, so this is rare, is the point, uh, and definitely for it to last this long. So the degree is rare and, and the length hasn't happened before. But I think the other thing is that's also interesting is you've got to remember that you don't need this to reverse for value to outperform going forward. Because that structural component is still positive for value, even if no mean reversion happens, value continues to be as cheap as it is today to growth, as rare as that has, is relative to historical norms, value should outperform going forward uh, because of that structural edge uh, that it has. Now, I cannot tell you when that will reverse, but I guess the message is that, yes, it's been painful, but it's probably getting towards the end of that move, A. And B, if you don't use simple metrics, and we don't, then you could outperform like we've done by actually having a more sophisticated way in, in, in basically uh, determining intrinsic value as opposed to a simple uh, kind of book value multiple or even a simple PE or uh, EV EBIT. The odds continue to be in value's favor to outperform over long periods of time. There's some evidence that's, that this has already started to happen. Uh, and, and I think that as more and more people start to adopt a more sophisticated approach to deciding whether something is value or growth, uh, you'll see that a lot of this whole debate uh, was a complete waste of time, I think. Now, I'm going to hand you over to Aubrey shortly, but before that, one more video. Hi, Aziz. Congratulations on the 10th anniversary of Maiar and more importantly, on your uh, much longer uh, devotion to the uh, to the principles of value investing and uh, wealth preservation. As uh, Charlie Munger says, the first rule of making money is don't lose it. Congrats, and I wish I was there with you. Hello, thank you for joining us. So I'd like to talk about a couple of businesses uh, which we own. We'd like to perhaps talk about why we own them and also what has happened in the last year, because this has been such a difficult year, especially for an analyst. Uh, 
see some companies I've seen where revenues have been down at 90 and at the same time prices have been up 90. Uh, this has created a huge amount of noise and it's been very, very difficult uh, for us to see through. So the first company I'd like to talk about would be Danone. Now, this is a business that owns an excellent portfolio of brands, uh, some of which you can see here. Actmel, Activia, Evian, I'm sure all of you know Evian, and Actmel. Uh, now, they come into three segments, which as you can see, the dairy, waters, and specialized nutrition, which includes baby milk. Uh, now, this is a fantastic business with 25% margins or greater. And one of the reasons they get this, these margins is because they can charge a premium for this product. Because, well, parents can often be suckers. I remember myself when uh, picking a car seat, and we were going through the department store and uh, said, oh, uh, there's this one. The salesman said, oh, yes, you could buy that. That's uh, only £100. Uh, this is one I have. Uh, it's £300, but I love my children. So, um, <clears throat> you know, when selling to parents, if you can sell safety, and something that uh, you know, is a well-known, well-branded product, you can often charge a huge premium. And this is something that they have here. Now, sadly, Danone has underperformed over the last five, well, and actually the last 10 years. But um, the average margin has been about two points lower. Growth has been 2% as opposed to 3% compared to its uh, uh, peer group. Total shareholder return has also been considerably lower. And you, you might be saying, okay, so why are we buying it? Well, here's the thing. When you've got a great set of brands and a great set of products, you know that this can be turned around. So it was about a year ago they decided that they would turn it around. We started to get interest in, interested and think, okay, are they going to be able to turn around? Are they going to be able to increase their margin? And management came out with a few presentations. Uh, and uh, they planned to cut, cut, cut. Sorry, they planned to cut costs. Uh, and they also planned to cut a huge number of SKUs, stock keeping units, by about 30%. But we still didn't give them full credibility for this. That being said for us, it was cheap enough that we could buy it and not require the turnaround to work. But what then, ha uh, what then happened, actually, sorry, let me uh, go back. You know, we, we didn't want them to just focus on cu cutting costs because this wasn't 100% of the reason that they'd been underperforming. They had also been underspending on R&D, which meant that they hadn't been developing premium products. They had not been competing with new entrants such as Chobani, who came in on the dairy market and competed uh, by introducing Greek yogurt to the market. They hadn't been innovating. And one of the things that we've seen is that they have spent less on R&D than their competitors. Now, this turnaround that uh, they wanted was not going to focus on that. So we were a little bit disappointed. However, then come in uh, Bluebell. Now, uh, Bluebell are a small activist fund with actually less AUM than, uh, than we do, but they also have um, a CEO who was the ex-CEO of uh, Bulgari. Uh, they, are, they also act as advisors to uh, the likes of Elliot, uh, and uh, in this case, Artisan, who, uh, who do have quite a bit of clout. So after a boardroom coup, uh, Emmanuel Faber, the former CEO and chairman of, uh, <clears throat> of Danone, was removed and uh, replaced with uh, Antoine Saint-Afrique. And he was formerly of Barry, uh, Barry Calbaut, uh, where the chocolate manufacturer, where he delivered some fantastic returns. And so now we have much greater confidence in the turnaround story, because as we've seen so many times before, turnarounds are most likely to work when they have outsiders come in 
and when they focus on innovation and revenues, which is exactly what he plans, which is what we'd hoped for. And now we just have to wait and see. Now, the next company I'd like to discuss is SAP. SAP is a wonderful business. They do ERP software, enterprise resource planning. Now, the uh, sadly, software is pretty hard to you know, get a great picture of. Um, so it's not like a chemical plant or wind turbine where you can uh, really easily visualize them. ERP is slightly hard to visualize. So I've got a picture of a chemical plant. In fact, that is Croda in Hull. Uh, and the reason I've got a picture of Croda uh, is because it was actually there that I first really got to understand SAP. Uh, I was a chemicals analyst at the time, touring the plant, and I was just absolutely blown away by the complexity of the plant, but how they could swap swap chemical chains almost within minutes. Well, okay, maybe that's a slight exaggeration. And, and I asked, how on earth are you able to do this? How, how can you, you know, maintain such manage such complexity? And they said the answer was SAP. It was something that they just could not live without. And then throughout uh, other chemical plants, which I uh, have been through and witnessed, uh, they've all said the same thing. You know, we cannot live without SAP. But of course, that could just mean that they're hostage to, uh, to SAP. And certainly this is something that we saw with companies like Oracle, where you get in and then you just can never leave. But with SAP, it is a business that actually generates a significant ROI. And you know, whilst I tried to work it out there, uh, Forrester's uh, consultancy have actually already done that for us with a huge number of interviews. They worked out that most customers get a payback within 10 months and a total ROI of 170%. Well, we really like it when a company can deliver such great customer economics. Um, now, what has happened during COVID? Well, uh, and the last year, you know, unsurprisingly, licenses and uh, uh, services growth has been pretty negative and the market was not happy with this. Um, now, this was to be expected because, look, you know, if um, you cannot go to someone's uh, site, you cannot install uh, the software on there. So this was a natural, natural outcome. But what we have also seen is a really significant uh, growth and increase in cloud spend, you know, in multi-tenant, in, uh, <clears throat> in their new products, uh, SAP by design. And you know, we've seen uh, the backlog certainly uh, increase very significantly in the last couple of quarters. Now, why this is great is because whilst it has an initial cost and this acceleration has led to a margin reset, um, this has a much higher NAV, MPV over time. You know, when a client you know, gets, swaps over to subscription, uh, they have a higher MPV over seven years by about 30%. You know, this is because instead of paying a million dollars in year one and then 220 you know, for the next five, they actually pay, let's say, 400,000 a year as a subscription increasing uh, with inflation. Well, actually, with most SAP clients, they increase according to a KPI, be it seats or revenues or some other KPI. So we get that index growth. Uh, with it. Uh, now, we've witnessed similar transformations with stocks such as Adobe, and we believe we're seeing it here, but just over a longer period of time. And that means you have to elongate your, um, your time horizon a little bit. But that is one of the things we like to do here. The final stock I'd like to discuss with you is Ashted. Now, this is one of my favorite businesses. Initially, when I first looked at it, it did seem quite boring, and I couldn't understand how this would be a really high quality business. They lease equipment. I mean, they own 11,000 JCB two and a half ton mini excavators, which, yeah, actually, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, I can be a little bit of a little boy at times, but anyhow, um, they are the second largest equipment rental uh, firm in America. 
and they have market share of 10 percent that's because it's such a fragmented market but here's the thing they can buy for 20 percent cheaper so they can go to jcb and buy their equipment 20 percent cheaper than anyone else and that i'd accept that that i sort of expected them to be able to do that but what i did not expect is that they can lease it out for 20 percent more now why this is important is because and why they're able to do this is because they have the scale they have they can get that equipment to you within the day so if you are working in construction and all of a sudden you need that uh excavator or you need to have it replaced or you need a new tool a cherry picker to you know uh, for vertical access they can get it to you within the day and if you're working in construction that is worth way more than 20 percent because if you don't have it when you need it uh, the delays and the cost of delays are going to be ex an order of magnitude higher so this is why we like it but you know <clears throat> you know obviously uh, this has been uh, a trying time uh, and we'd expected them to do a lot worse than they actually did you know, we certainly knew that they were going to be far better off than they were in the great financial crash because they'd restructured their debt, because they'd uh, ensured that the business was less cyclical. But we we did not think that general tool equipment would have recovered pretty much to pre uh, pre pandemic levels already. That being said, what we really did not uh, what we really were not expecting was also that total revenues were going to grow because their specialty business was able to do so well you see they have a huge number of uh, specialty uh, <clears throat> projects with medical testing with um, <clears throat> everything related to uh, vaccination centers with uh, medical test centers these have been have created a huge amount of demand which led to uh, revenues growing uh, nine percent of the year throughout that but the investment thesis still stands they still only have 55 percent rental penetration and that's the market and they whilst they still only have the 10 percent market share and what's so great about this is it gives them so much room to grow there is so much room in specialty in <clears throat> that we can see you know, a long runway for uh, super normal growth while still uh, <clears throat> you know being sensibly priced now we're going to take a quick break after uh, this video uh, coming up thank you well done on getting to your 10th anniversary i know from personal experience it's not easy and i wish you all the best for the next 10 and indeed possibly 20 or 30 years Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, we're now here in the Q&A section of the presentation. Um, we haven't received any questions due to a technical issue at the moment. So if there are questions that you would like to submit uh, in this meeting, we can address them in the meeting. Please email either me at mark.cox at mayorcapital.com or uh, ir at mayorcapital.com and we'll be able to field those questions uh, as we receive them. But at the moment, we're not able to uh, field them via team. So apologies for that. Um, while you are submitting those questions, we do have some that were uh, pre-submitted. So um, uh, with your, uh, uh, we'll get straight on to, on to those. The first is uh, a common theme that we get asked in our quarterly Q&A. It's not something that's, uh, the core of our strategy, but it's Bitcoin and crypto more generally. Uh, we've had a few questions on this, so I'd like to open it out to Aziz and Aubrey to have some general thoughts about crypto's place in the world. And one specific question, which is, is are there any plans to launch a Bitcoin share class in the new usage fund? Right. Well, I, I guess if we wanted to uh, enter the El Salvador market, we would actually be required to now that it's legal tender. But apart from that, 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the one of the biggest challenges, and I, I guess we can get back back to some of the other issues. One of the biggest challenges with with using Bitcoin as uh, a medium of exchange is the volatility of of its value, and and we'll we'll get into why that may or may not be relevant. It may not be relevant. I mean, a lot of things are volatile. That's fine, right? But specifically to use it as a medium of exchange, just like money, basically, or it, as a money, uh, it needs to be more stable. I mean, the, there was a funny thing uh, a few days ago. The, the ransom that, uh, what's the pi U.S. pipeline that recently got hacked? To? Uh, colonial partners. Yeah, so they, they paid the ransom in, in, in Bitcoin. And, and actually, believe it or not, this is for all those uh, uh, people using Bitcoin for less than legal uh, activities. You, you should be worried about this. Uh, I guess, which is uh, the the government was able to trace back uh, the bitcoins and give it back to the company or the majority of it. Actually, it was the um, problem though. It was Brentag. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Brentag. Uh, so Brentag, one of our holdings, actually was ransomed at the same time, yeah. and uh, they paid 4.4 million. And before the government did it, it was a um, academic at um, Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha, working for Stephen Wolfram, yeah. who um, managed to figure out uh, and trace them yeah. uh, because the blockchain is not anonymous. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the problem, though, for, for people is, is the money they actually got back was, was a lot less in dollars <laughs> than when they paid it, but about a couple of million dollars. So it's, again, one of the issues of using it as a medium exchange. I mean, if you can't use money for ransom, what else are you going to use it for? But, so, uh, I, I do wonder, though, with uh, El Salvador, uh, is there any coincidence that uh, El Salvador probably has, I think, 8% of GDP being cocaine? And uh, the link between criminality uh, as a percentage of GDP and the adoption of uh, Bitcoin as legal tender? Well, I don't, I don't know if you can make any <laughs> grand assumptions about the government of El Salvador. Uh, I mean, they may have a solid wealth fund. Who knows? Uh, but I, I think that's, I mean, yes, volatility is a problem if it's, if it's to be used as money. I think that's, that's a big challenge. Now, whether it's going to be uh, a, a store of value in a sense, like a digital gold, whether it's crypto or Bitcoin or whatever it is, I mean, to me, there are, there are two separate arguments. The first one is whether Bitcoin specifically is the right one to own. And then the second one is, is whether it's crypto. Even if even if we did establish that crypto can be an asset class that continues to be a store of value for many, many years, which I, will, I never disputed that it could. I mean, people collected Pokemon cards and baseball cards and attribute value to them. People attribute value to things that I think are worthless. They, they might continue. I personally think gold is, is the same. I mean, it's, it's also worthless. I mean, apart from a few industrial uses, even jewelry as a use is actually comes from effectively using it as a store of value. Uh, I think the biggest challenge is we've got hundreds or thousands of these crypto uh, currencies is, is determining which one is going to end up to be the one that endures is, is tricky. And as it is with most emerging technologies, it's, it's, it's tricky to have. But do I think that it could uh, have value down the road of, of, of some amount? Like I said, people assign value to things that I think are worthless. So, sure, it could. Will we ever issue a Bitcoin uh, asset uh, share class? I guess if we can hedge it, which is very hard to do now, but at some point if we could and an investor demands it, who cares? I mean, if this is what they want, I guess. Uh, in theory, if, if it, it does succeed and it becomes mainstream enough that you can hedge it, then from our point of view, we don't really care how you want to hold your, your assets. Um, you're not really holding them in Bitcoin, it's just a, a share class. But we'll, we'll cross that bridge when, when we get to it. Uh, I know we're not going to be investing in it, at least anytime soon. What do you think? Uh, there is one interesting development that's happened with uh, Bitcoin and the crypto exchanges, which is um, Tether. So a lot of, um, a lot of cryptocurrencies when you buy them, you often buy them with other cryptocurrencies because you go to an exchange like Coinbase and you, you go into crypto land. But the first thing you do when you go into crypto land is you buy Tether, which is meant to be dollar for dollar, you know, yeah. pegged to the dollar. So every 
Tether coin you buy, you are buying one dollar because you know the people behind Tether, you know, are meant to put one dollar behind it. Guess what? They don't. Uh, I don't know what they do with that money. I don't want to make any. Uh, but uh, it has turned out that there's only about one dollar for every hundred. Uh, now, the trouble with this, and I think this is one of the reasons you've got this sort of Bitcoin crash recently, and it could go on, is that people have le levered up based on their tether holdings, which turn out to be fictitious. So, um, yeah, maybe the House of Cards is falling apart and might be falling apart right now. Uh, so, but I'd certainly be very careful if anyone is looking at any of these stable coins or whatever, because there is very little regulation out there to protect you. Yeah, I definitely. I mean, this this has always been an issue that we've had with it in the past years, which is lack of regulation. But the question is, in a future where there is regulation, would it work? And and, and one argument that I've heard being used uh, in support of Tether is, well, you know what, governments issue stable coins in the form of fiat currency without that much backing. And so why can't Tether do it? And, and, and I think, and by the way, I mean, in terms of regulation, of stable coins, governments are already starting to look into this and realizing that, listen, you guys are doing something bad and we're going to stop you. Uh, to me, the biggest difference is who's behind it. So, and, and, and I'll give you an, exa an example that I think learned about only recently. So in Scotland, three banks are allowed to issue Scottish pounds. Uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, the Bank of Scotland, and uh, Clydesdale, is it? Uh, yes, yeah. that'll be it. So the th they're allowed to issue pounds, but the Bank of England says in order to be able to issue these banknotes that the public use, use in, in Scotland and, and elsewhere, it's legal tender here as well in England, uh, you must have either Bank of England issued banknotes or reserve in the Bank of England as private entities that is not the central government. Sure, we're allowing you to issue what is effectively a stable coin in the form of paper. However, it needs to be backed one by one. And the reason that is the case is only government can force you to use its own currency. Anyone else, a private se sector cannot. cannot. Uh, government can easily do it by virtue of asking you to pay your taxes in it. And so I think as long as governments continue to force you to pay taxes, and as, as much as I, I wish that could change, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. When the government tells you you have to pay your taxes, you pay your taxes. And, and if you don't, then they've got a big army that can <laughs> force you to do it. As long as that is the case, they can also force you to use whatever currency they want. And they're not going to give up that power. Uh, so to me, the, the biggest argument against this has always been, from my point of view, that it just runs against the interests of governments. They're not going to let you do it. Once it becomes big enough, they're going to tell you, no, you can't. OK, well, I'm, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we are receiving uh, email questions. Uh, as a reminder, the address to me, mark.cox at Mayor Capital. Mark with a C. Mark with a C, yes. Um, and uh, IR, which is probably an easier yeah. uh, email, just IR at Mayor Capital dot com will also uh, get your question to the panel. Uh, so uh, the first of those is uh, related to Nordstrom. Um, we've uh, we've spoken about it, I think, at the last two meetings, and there's something of a turnaround this time. Um, would you care to share a few thoughts about that? Well, I think it's it's definitely been a turnaround the stock since last year. I think when we spoke about it last year was it was a, a very low point in terms of the stock, and and we did talk about ridiculously cheap we thought it was at the time relative to its, its prospects and we even at the time i think we we admitted as we always say that you know what not everything works out and companies do go bust from time to time especially kind of in, in in that uh uncommon situation that we were in 2020 in terms of basically having zero revenue for for so long uh the stock has recovered now and I, it's definitely not as cheap as it was. Uh, now, operationally, I think a lot of good things have happened uh, to to Nordstrom. It's I, I think that I mean, as challenging as the past decade has been, 
I think the management team has executed as, as well as I think they could. I think there's always a challenge when you're in industry uh, where the industry overall is being dragged down by very powerful forces. So our assessment of the quality of, of, of Nordstrom as a brand and as a company was correct in a relative sense to other retailers. Uh, many other competitors have gone bust. Uh, but at the same time, actually, the fact that many of their competitors have gone bust in the short term has hurt them. You've had this pressure, ongoing pressure year in, year out uh, from that kind of massive liquidation of, of the industry. And, and yeah, sure. I mean, there are there are forces that are beyond their control that I think are, uh, are, are, are across all retail. Now, in terms of what happened in the recent past, I think the two big things to highlight and why I still believe this is going to work out as an investment. And by the way, and we've owned Nordstrom off and on for many years. This is our third time of, of owning it. And, and the one that's been the most disappointing, I guess the first two times we did well with them. Uh, A, the online side of the business is already half of uh, the company's sales. And I think if you look at comparables for that online business, it's worth way more than the whole company. In fact, we have a recent example. Saks did this, uh, a, a carve out of its online business and, uh, and, sold it, uh, and sold part of that equity to a third party. And again, if you value, and, and I think Nordstrom.com is a much better business than the Saks.com business. Uh, and if you value it that way, again, that's worth a lot more uh, than the overall company. Now, the other, I think, Crown Jewel in Nordstrom is the, the discount part, the uh, Nordstrom rack business, which continues to do well. And again, isn't valued as much as some of its uh, competitors like uh, uh, TJ, uh, TJX, TJ Maxx and, and Marshalls and Ross, uh, even though I think it's, it's just as good, if not better, especially in the online side of things. Uh, the, the full line brick and mortar, I think continues to be a challenge, but I think their ability to leverage their store base. And luckily, unlike others, they didn't have an overexpanded, uh, unprofitable store base. Uh, does mean that with, with fixed costs, especially during the pandemic, it, it gets hard uh, to have that. That being said, I'm very intrigued by what they're doing with it in terms of using that store base and their Nordstrom, especially their Nordstrom local concept, where they think they've done a good job combining the physical footprint with the online business. Now, the other interesting thing that they're doing now that's part of their nearly uh, uh, recently uh, announced strategy is having third parties sell on their websites where Nordstrom does not own the inventory. So it's an asset light model, but they can have third parties sell and fulfill through them. I think that's a very interesting. Uh, it's still an experiment, I think, at this stage. But I think if it works out, I think that could really have uh, have legs and I think could add a lot of value uh, without having to invest a lot of money incrementally in, uh, in that. What do you think? Well, there's one thing that I think people miss about Nordstrom, and that is how difficult apparel retail is online. Now, I, I learned a bit about this actually through a friend of mine who uh, used to work at John Lewis. And, um, well, he was the CTO there, and he was telling me about how they installed a system by NAP. Uh, that's NAP with a K, and sadly, it's a business that is private and we can't invest in. But uh, what they do is on on garment hanger systems, and they produce these massive sort of modular Lego-like factories where you have your clothes on the hanger. See, Nordstrom and John Lewis, they don't sell rubbish like Boohoo. You know, they, they don't have dresses that you can just throw in a box and, you know, whip into a, you know, little, uh, you know, envelope and send off. Uh, you know, neither do they like uh, Netaporte, where you're selling dresses for thousands upon thousands, so you're doing low inventory. You're trying to deal with a large inventory quantity, but that has to be stored on a uh, on garment you cannot put a suit in a box without ruining it there are certain dresses that you can't just box you have to store them on the hanger 
And this poses a, you know, a lot of complexity um, you know, for the mechanical storage, and not just the mechanical storage, but how do you then get it from there into the, you know, into the post? Um, and you know, this thing from NAP is just amazing, but it's, it's very expensive and takes a long time uh, to install. And so John Lewis did it, not because uh, they wanted to be, you know, they, they were online profits, uh, but actually because London property prices were so expensive that they had to move inventory out of London. Uh, so they had to come up with something clever. Uh, but, and, you know, my friend was telling me about how Nordstrom are doing the same thing and he'd been talking to them about how they can uh, implement it. And so basically, this is Nordstrom, now that they have this, it is a massive advantage to them because Saks, you know, and all Macy's, all these. Uh, companies which are really struggling for financing are not going to be able to afford the hundreds of millions, you know, possibly up to a billion, that it will require to to install this system. And without it, you just can't, you just cannot scale uh, apparel uh, online. So that puts them in a really good uh, position. But you know, again, it takes time for uh, to watch this pan out. I think the, 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 the big thing that I'm both excited and maybe frightened a little bit about is this is something that's been happening for 10 plus years at a very slow pace. The pandemic happens and then suddenly you're accelerating and your competitors are accelerating. So now everyone is, is sprinting and you had a head start. And I think you're running as fast if not faster than others. But I think we will know relatively soon whether this Whether is going to work out or not, I made a mistake <laughs> on, on it. I, I, to me, within the next two years, we're going to have a lot more cl clarity uh, uh, compared to what I used to think in terms of how long it will take. Okay, well, the, the next question has come in via email, and it's about the research affiliate paper that you briefly touched on. And uh, I guess it's something of a challenge, really, that the French and Pharma have demonstrate yes that the value factor does exist but is the additional risk or the idiosyncratic risk that you take commensurate with the returns over that time yeah i think this is a this is a common this is a common comment in fact one of my best friends who's uh nadisha masi who's a uh, a professor of finance and much smarter than i am about these things i always have this uh discussion with him uh, and 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 as you as you do when talking about fun things like academic papers, uh, you you get into the the idea. I think is the way at least I think about it is. So first, it wouldn't be an idiosyncratic risk. It would be if it was an, on a company level. Then yes, but we're we're talking about a factor that's across the market. So it would be uh, it needs to be a, a factor. So basically, the idea from Fama and French is yes. There is a value factor. Yes, it does outperform, but it is just one other source of risk. So you've got the volatility that's captured by the beta. You've got all these other variables, and this is one more risk factor. You're taking more risk by investing in, in, in this bucket, these types of companies, and so you should have at least a higher expected return. Uh, the way I think about it is, is I think there's a slight nuance to it. Is I think value that value factor that value bucket has higher perceived risk and so because we're talking in the realm of expectations of investors then because you perceive something to be of higher risk you demand a higher expected return but the reality is it's not actually a higher risk you just think that it's high risk and you're wrong uh, in, in saying that, but as long as everyone thinks that thing is high risk, regardless of the fact, then you could have a systematic, consistently higher returns investing in it. Now, what makes someone able to not see that perceived risk? Well, I mean, I, I think I've talked this about this before. I, I do think that, I don't know, maybe... A, to be a value investor, your mom dropped you on your head when you were younger. 
there, there was a, 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 an article that I shared earlier today on Twitter from Morningstar about a, a paper that in, in Finland that looked at personality traits and how some personalities are more likely to be growth or value. It's a nice story. I don't know if I agree with, with everything in it. But this seems to be a subset of investors who are not afraid of, they do not see that perceived risk. They do not see value as higher risk and are able to invest without being bothered by whatever bothers everyone else in these invest investments. And so they get more money investing in that. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to accept that explanation that it is, it's one factor. You see it, I don't see it, so I, I get to make more money off of it. It's, it's reasonable. I, I don't see how to test it empirically to decide whether or not uh, it's true. Do you agree with you? Well, so I mean, the, the trouble I have when, whenever we discuss this is that we're often, I think, dealing with uh, the semantic sting. Uh, now, this was something, a concept by a jurisprudential uh, philosopher, uh, Ronald Dworkin, who I was lucky enough actually to study under uh, UCL. But um, what the semantic sting is, is it's basically talking at cross purposes. I understand one thing by this term, Aziz understands something else. And value, I have never seen as many definitions for a single term as I have with value. And it varies from, you know, the cigar butt uh, trading at a net net to someone who believes value can be, it, Tesla could be a value stock because it is going to, uh, okay, no, I, I can't even make, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, not, like, even stop, I stop me there. not, not even in jest, <laughs> can I? Um, but, but growth absolutely is a part of value. It is certainly part of intrinsic value. But what is a value investor? <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> again, we have so many different definitions. So when we argue about the value factor, we're, we're arguing often at cross purposes because we just have different ideas. And whenever anyone really talks about a value factor, you know, I, I think, hang on, you cannot put it down in a simple number. And you certainly cannot put down the work I do in a simple number because there are so many factors which have no numbers, where, where there are soft judgments that we have to make about what the future might be, what what a appropriate margin of safety is. And when you combine all them into you know, an investment thesis to for a value investment, you, you just can't, uh, because you can't measure it. You cannot quantify what is and is not a value investment. It just is or is not, according to your opinion. So, um, and then because you cannot quantify and you cannot well, you can repeat it, but you cannot officially put it down in paper. You're not going to be able to get it. Uh, there is no structured data where you can go and back test it because you cannot take me back in time and say, well, what would you have done in this situation? Yeah. And, and, so, and if it was that simple, we wouldn't have a job. So let's hope yeah. that's not. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, yeah. So like. So for value investors, is the factor real or technicals? You know, you can argue with all these papers as much as you want, but at the end of the day, we can see the results of value in maybe our funds, certainly in funds, uh, you know, with managers like Buffett. You can argue about technicals, but then you can see the results of Renaissance technologies. Yeah, you know, there's no use arguing with success. Okay. Uh, just a reminder about how to um, submit questions via email. If you didn't catch the email at the beginning, if you check your inbox now, you should be able to find a link to, to my email address. If you click that, that um, you'll be able to submit your question uh, that, that way. Uh, one person that has done that uh, has asked, can you comment on the discovery stock in relation to the Archegos situation? earlier in the year. I think people who haven't been following this, there was a sort of leverage blow up that impacted uh, Credit Suisse and the unwinding of that had some impact on stocks, including Discovery, which is in our portfolio. Sorry, is there a question there? Yeah, can, can, you, comment? can you comment? Well, I, I think the big thing to take out of that is that if you're a fund royalty and if you worked under Jimmy Robinson, a tiger you are, People are willing to throw money at you no matter how many mistakes you make. 
uh, I think that's really the, the shocking uh, realization there. I mean, the some of the information is still coming out about what happened there, why the banks gave him so much money and how they traded in certain ways so no one knows, knew how much they actually owned. And uh, I think these things happen from time to time, as long as they're not a threat systematically to the system, then who cares if some investors lose money? Uh, it is it is shocking that the banks have lended them that much money. And if I were a banking regulator, I'd be very upset about it. But uh, yeah, I think we'll we'll learn more over time. One of the investor lessons that uh, you may have seen on Twitter that Aziz uh, recorded and, and we've sent out on social media warns about leverage. And I, I guess you meant in terms of uh, company leverage, but it just goes to show how dangerous that can be when it, when it turns out. No, I, I think even on your own yeah, portfolio as well, just like in this case, I mean, when some, when you're leveraged and the bank liquidates your portfolio to get their money back, you are a forced seller. You never want to be a forced seller. And I mean, we bought back Discovery after selling it and when that happened because there's nothing better than buying something from someone who has to sell regardless of the price. So uh, I think it's, it's uh, as if, the problem with being a forced seller, I think this came up in one of the Q&A uh, sessions that we have is you might be right in the end, but if you get taken out of the game midway, then who cares? Well, I think with Archie, there is a there is a slightly darker element to this, um, which is that what so a, friend, uh, a couple of my friends have been on the other side of his trades. Uh, they were short some of these stocks like GSX, which he owns. Now that is well, you can go and read what Muddy Waters and a lot of other people have written about GSX, but um, it's hard to see that there's any value in that uh, at all. But you had this guy who was pumping these stocks up and um, what it looks like he was doing was a gamma squeeze, which um, where he's basically buying stocks, uh, forcing uh, op and he's buying options and forcing covering, uh, which is, you know, killing the shorts. And it's the same thing that's been happening with uh, GameStop uh, and the Reddit crowd. And it's effectively, um, uh, well, it could have been market manipulation. And uh, yeah, uh, that's now come unstuck. So I don't have a huge amount of sympathy uh, yeah. with him on this one. Yeah, okay. neither do I. Thank you for that. Um, can you comment on the drivers of AUM over the last 12 months? It's grown uh, pretty significantly uh, since then. So a, a few comments on that would be welcome. Two words, Mark Cox. <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you that I didn't send in this, uh, this question. Oh, more, a a big performance is also. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, is that well? <laughs> <laughs> We're not 50% <laughs> <laughs> uh, Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, I... <laughs> Performance. <laughs> I mean, sure, performance helps. I think, I think that if you perform well over time, eventually things work out. Uh, and I think the longer you do it, the more people, the more people that are on the fence are going to join. And so there are there are people. There's always someone who's been watching you for a year or two or three. I think size begets size to some degree as well. There were people that wanted to invest. We were too small for them. So that was another factor. I think there are a lot of things. I don't think there's one reason. Uh, so it's a combination of performance, time, and size, I guess, and, and Mark Cox. Well, <laughs> I, I, I take the compliment, but I'd also like to reflect it back to our existing investors as well. So a lot of the investor growth actually comes That's from true. client recommendations that, that we have uh, from those investors that have had good experience over that long term that we try to invest. So we we're, more, we're really grateful for you out there who uh, have recommended friends and family uh, and continue to, to do so as well. So as much as I'd like to take uh, all the credit and be the salesperson, very tempted to do so, uh, uh, the accuracy means that I have to uh, give credit where it's due. So thank you to everyone for not just the support of their own investment, but talking about Mayo in, the, in their circles. It's, it's something that helps us build an investor base that shares the values of Mayo, shares the uh, long-term outlook of mail, which in turn helps us deliver on the objectives uh, that we have set out. Uh, another another couple of questions uh, regarding mail specifically. We've spoken about the uh, the 
redomiciliation of the farm from Cayman to Ireland, one of the changes that uh, will happen is that the NAV will be struck not once a month as it currently is, but every two weeks. And how is that consistent with that long-term objective? Yeah, well, the, the EU says that the the shortest period you can have is two weeks, so that's what we're doing. Uh, I Sorry, the longest period that you have is two weeks, so that's what we're doing. If it were up to me, I think in a perfect world, we'd do it once a year. And, and then we wouldn't have to spend so much time doing reporting. Uh, that being said, practically speaking, we always have investors who may need money and need to get out, or investors who want to come in. So for practical reasons, since inception, we've done it monthly uh, because of that. I think it would be wrong to force people in any way not to leave because even a long-term investor who's been with you or even someone who does, did come in with the intention of being a long-term investor, I mean, the reason they say you save money is to use it in an emergency or, or to put a down payment on a house or whatever it is. So the, the whole purpose of saving is to have that money that you can reach to uh, when you need it. So it's the bigger we are, the more scale we have, the easier it is to offer this uh, liquidity. And our investment strategy, uh, things that we own are very liquid. So by all means, it, it doesn't hurt any, any of the existing investors for us to uh, to do it. And because we're bigger, we can invest in a bigger team and the operation and all kind of infrastructure needed to do it. Uh, and, and I think the only thing we demand of investors is when they come in, uh, that they have the intentions of staying for three uh, to five years or longer. And if they don't, then I just, as a word of advice, we're not the right fund for them. No, absolutely. Uh, I would just like to say we're, we're coming up towards the end of the allotted time there. We're also coming up to the end of the submitted question. So if there is something you'd like to ask, a reminder that you can do so via email, there should be a link in your inbox. But the, the at the moment, the final question is, the team's growing, we've added uh, two additional people this year, I'm sure we, we will in the future as well. With that growth of the team, how uh, can we ensure the consistency of approach that has uh, driven the track record since um, over the last 10 years? That's an excellent question. I think, and I, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Aubrey, in a minute, because uh, I think you, Lately, I've been working a lot on, on this question. I think one of the key things about what we do is that even when I was working by myself, I've always believed in the importance of having a consistent, well-defined investment process. And my thinking at the time when I was doing it is it was a way to force me to be consistent with myself across time and across, well, moods, I guess. Uh, you don't want a, a manager who runs a process where if it's nice and the sun is out and the weather is nice, they do one thing. And if it's gloomy and rainy and cold, they do something else. Or I don't know, if they don't sleep well or uh, whatever on, 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 on the night before, they, they behave differently. So I've always, try to design things since day one in a way to maximize consistency. Uh, and I think when Aubrey joined, it really forced me at the time to even work more on not just the practicalities of running a process where there are more multiple uh, people involved, but also more theoretically about how we think about it, how we think about decisions, how we manage even before the decision stage, how we manage the process in evaluating and following up on investments. And I think this is just a continuation. I think it's an ongoing project that should never stop. There's always more to do, whether it's on the theoretical, philosophical side of things, or even on the technological side of things to, to ensure better collaboration and consistency across members. And I'll hand it over to Aubrey because it's one of the things that he's been working on as well. Yeah, so this is obviously one of the hardest elements of, uh, of this job, I think. Uh, and as he says, when, when I first joined, there was, you know, we had a big drive to how are we going to formalize the process. But 
but at the same time, it was just two of us. So there's always just that back and forth, you know, that you can just sort of, you know, lean across the desk and, you know, say, hey, look at this, what do you think of this? You know, and you can lean the other way, have a look at my screen. And it, it's very easy for a process to be very fluid and dynamic at the time uh, and flexible. Um, but the more, as we grow, and as we set our sights on further growth, we have to be more and more formalized. And that becomes, uh, that becomes more and more of a challenge for us uh, because all the things that we could have done, uh, you know, we don't have that ability to just suddenly lean across. Well, actually we do, but it's... Uh, but we want to design it in a way where it would work without that. Exactly. Yeah. And where it work where we could have a sixth member of the team who isn't going to be able to... They're yeah. sitting in Singapore or... Yeah. And, you know, so that has meant, you know, we have had to formalize things to a much greater level. And we've had to think much, much harder about the technology. And we've discussed the technologies that we've used in score checklists. And, you know, we're continually adapting these, continually thinking about, you know, what will work now, but not just what will work now, what, what works 10 years from now. And that, that is a real challenge to think, you know, how am I going to be able to operate this with 10 people, with 20, with, okay, maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves there, but, but also some of the different with, locations. With 10x different locations, yeah. 10x the AUM, 100x the AUM. 100x the computing power. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> there are a lot of things. I do think that this is a game, and I call it a game in, in the sports sense, that how you improve, you look at any sport and like the, you can look at a football team and say, oh, well, they've been playing the same game. No, they haven't been playing the same game. Technology, whether it's on the training side or how the game is played or how it's coached or how it's even uh, uh, refereed and all of these things have to adapt in an ever-changing world. Uh, and, 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 and it's, it's, it's never ending. And if you sit still, it stops working because the world is changing. Exactly. Imagine an investor from, actually, we don't even have to go back. I was going to say 50 years ago, but we don't even have to go that far. 25 years ago, you wouldn't really, you would have been, bug, you'd have a telex maybe, but you wouldn't have that sheer volume of data that you type in company's ticker and you have their 10 year financial history, you have their price, you have, you know, 101 related indicators based on commodity prices or wh whatever you want, it is there in front of you. Now, could you imagine that investor from 25 years ago who's got, all he's got a, a copy of company refs, uh, you know, he's written to management uh, asking for them to post him a annual report. Imagine him competing with, uh, I wouldn't say us, but just anyone with access to Bloomberg, FactSet, Microsoft Excel, uh, Dropbox, eh, eh, you name all these products. There is no competition. It, it, it is so hard to compete. And we have to think about how we're going to design a process that is going to evolve over the next 25 years. And I think the other thing is, it, it works both ways. So one of the things I remember when I started investing, I had the, the challenge in that, I mean, I'm not that old, but. 20 years ago, uh, the challenge was getting access to information. And now, even at something as simple as my daily news alerts, the challenge is to find different ways to kind of filter down the fire hose of information that comes into my inbox every morning. So in, in, in many ways, the challenge isn't just <laughs> where to do more, but often it's also how to do less and how to see the signal for the noise. And, 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 and with all of these things, I think it's, like you said, it is, it is something where you just cannot compete if you're not doing it. And I also think it's something that ev every investor is always on kind of a treadmill of some kind of access to technology or information, whatever you, uh, uh, you want to call it, and you've got to keep running. And if you stop running, you, you fall. And you, no, yeah. Wolves will die.
Yeah. And, you know, this is part of it. And it's great to be in a position where we are forced you know, to uh, evolve. Yeah. You know, and as, you know, new joiners join, again, it just gives us that greater impetus and that sort of kick up the backside sometimes to, to help us to continue to evolve. And uh, we are, and we've been evaluating new technologies that we can use. Um, which I don't want to say too much about now because we don't need to get into the details. But yeah, uh, but yeah, it's uh, no, it's very exciting times. Yeah. Okay, well that brings us to the end of the Q and A sessions. There's no more questions that have uh, come in. I'll hand back to Aziz for some brief closing comments in a second. But uh, I'd like to thank all of you attending today, all of our investors and supporters, not just today but over the last ten years as well. It, as I've said earlier, it's a real honour and uh, we feel it very personally, uh, our obligations to you. So on behalf of Sophie and Stefan, who you heard from earlier today, we'd like to, to thank you. Um, please see my email address as the question box, not just on, uh, uh, on annual meetings, but on an ongoing basis. I'm, that's what I'm here to, to uh, help you along the journey. We, we believe the journey of investing is just as important as the destination as well. It's not only an investment return sense, but the way in which we communicate with you. So please feel free to view me as a resource in that regard. And uh, behalf of me and the rest of the team, thank you very much for, uh, for attending today. Uh, I'll hand over to Aziz, who will be able to bring the meeting to a close. Thank you, Mark. I, again, want to thank you all for attending today. Uh, it's a bit of an upgrade versus what we had to do in the midst of the pandemic last year, but it's not as fun as meeting you in person, in real life. So I really hope that next year we go back to doing that again. Uh, but I also want to thank all of you for your support over the past year and a half. I know it was a difficult year for everyone, and, and many of you have called and written in and sent messages throughout this period. And, I, and it's been just this incredible to get all your support. And like Mark said, a lot of you have referred your friends and family uh, to us. There is, it's, there is not, there isn't no higher honor than feeling that we've uh, uh, delivered to you that you want to have your close friends and family uh, and invest with us and trust their uh, savings with us. Uh, we promise you to treat everyone in the same high, uh, a way of our belief in, in, in being good stewards of your capital. Our capital is in there with you, as, as you all know, and, and we continue to manage it in a way that I think we'll all win together over the long term. Thank you again for attending today, and I look forward to seeing you in person in the near future.